Uh, we turn next to Dr. Um, Sir Felsen Ewing, um, and I think for the law audience, the best way to try and capture um, the extent and quality of her work is to use this analogy. Um, she has won multiple NIH grants, uh, which might be the equivalent of winning multiple really high-level appellate decisions. And recently, um, and recently, the NIH, every once in a while, they'll have landmark studies. So they just announced one 10 years, called the ABCD study. They're going to study thousands of adolescents every year longitudinally. And that's the equivalent of a Supreme Court case. Uh, Dr. Felstein Ewing is one of the key members of that grant, and we're very likely to have uh, her with us today. Let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you. This is a very exciting uh, place for me to be because it's an intersection between my world, which is science, and my husband's world, which is the federal public defender. And I see all of you guys in the back, so thank you so much for coming. <laughs> And, um, and I also know, you know, the millennials that I work with say that sitting is the new smoking. So if you feel like you need to st stand up and stretch your legs, feel free to do it while I'm talking. I, I will not be bothered. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit from what other people have been talking about today and kind of drop down the developmental scale to talk about adolescence. So a lot of us um, have talked a lot about the intersection of all these different things between the brain and addiction and behavior, but we haven't, it's really easy to think about adolescents as little tiny adults. They look like adults, um, they often pretend to be adults, but in fact, I'm gonna make the argument that they are very far from adults. So, compared with adults, Teen substance use is consistently inconsistent. So if you guys think about your own substance use, and I don't want you to tell me anything about it, most, <laughs> most adults use the same amount every day or of the same something. I often think about coffee as a parallel, right? Most people have one cup of coffee, have a very specific type of coffee that they have, and would be very upset if they didn't have that cup of coffee. Teens do not do that. Teens will use whatever is there whenever it's available. So, you know, if there's a party on Tuesday, they'll go to that party on Tuesday. And if there's a party on Saturday, they'll, they'll use substances there. They're not using the same amount every day the way that adults do. They also, you know, we talked lots about some of the cardinal markers of addiction in adults. And one of the main ones is withdrawal. And adolescents, even really heavy using adolescents, and we have adolescents, our juvenile justice involved adolescents in fact, use about 18 out of the last 30 days. So that's almost all days. And they show no signs of withdrawal even when you take them off of that substance. And so I just, you know, I think we just need to think about how the brain is processing these drugs very differently and not just presume that the models of addiction that we have for adults are the same for kids. Another t very um, traditional marker of addiction in adults is tolerance. Teens, if you hearken back to your own high school years, your body at 14 was totally different from your body at 18, or I hope, right? It would be really awkward if you stayed, had your 14-year-old body forever. So, you know, as your body gets bigger, you need more drug to achieve the same effect. That's not a sign of addiction in kids. That's just a sign of growth. We hope you grow, right? And so we, we don't want that, you know, I always think, let's it's just, I don't even use the DSM actually on most of my days with, with kids when I treat them. I just use a lot of the criteria and I can get to that later. Teens are also polysubstance users. As I said before, they don't pick one drug and stick with it. They'll use whatever's around. And this matters as we were talking about the opiate crisis. This matters as um, cannabis has become recreationally legalized, which has some benefits, lots of benefits in terms of the juvenile justice aspect, but some problems around increased availability for kids. So kids will use alcohol, cannabis, opiates, anything else that's around, they are not selective. They also do all sorts of other naughty things when they're using, right? <laughs> and so, um, as I learned when I Googled teen sex, you can see all sorts of things you never hope to see on the internet these days. Teenagers that get into all sorts of trouble related to their substance use, including delinquent behaviors that get them the attention of the juvenile justice system. So, you know, as I'm a teen treatment provider, I've been providing treatment for addiction for the last 15 years for kids. And I'll, I'll mention, I started in the juvenile justice system. I started working for the Vera Institute. My job was to get kids, arrested foster kids, out of jail. And so I've thought for a long time about how we could get kids improved treatment. 
One of the biggest issues for teens is that they don't see a problem with their use. And this is different from adults. Most of the adult treatment studies that we have were based on adults who self-referred for treatment. So if you look at these huge treatment studies, Project Match, Project Combine, those of you who are not uh, familiar in the addiction land, um, these were treatment studies where adults had to sign up to participate. So they had to say, yes, I'd like to cut back on my drinking, or yes, I'd like to cut back on my substance use in order to enroll. I, working 15 years with kids, have never had a, a, a kids come up to me and say, you know, Dr. Sarah, I'm really struggling with my cannabis use and I'd like to cut back, right? That has not yet, I would be so excited if that happened, but it hasn't happened yet. Instead, kids experience a ton of positive outcomes because of their use. So again, if you think back to your own high school days, and again, don't disclose, you know, there are all sorts of awesome things that happen when you use drugs. You get more friends, you get some courage, there are a lot, you get an increased social currency. So there are all sorts of really great things that kids encounter because of their substance use, which we pretend not to see, right? We're like, oh man, drugs are gonna be a big problem, but we don't, we, we really disregard some of the benefits that they're experiencing because of their drug use. As a result, they're not self-referring. They're not coming to us saying that they need treatment. Instead, they're coming to us because of their parents, their other, other um, providers, their coaches. And the, it, the biggest issue that I think we face as adolescent addiction providers is that most kids don't move into sustained addiction. That's not the biggest risk that I, I worry about. Most kids, you know, there is some worry and it's real about exposure to the brain and neurotoxic changes in the brain that happen because of drug use. But the bigger issue is that accidents and injuries are the number one cause of death for kids and drugs are the number one contributor to accidents and injuries in this age group. And so I worry about kids making foolish decisions when they're drinking or using cannabis, that that stuff is gonna cause huge irreparable harm that will change the course of their lives. That's what I worry about as a provider. So my goal is how can we reduce the harm associated with drinking and using cannabis so that kids are not making foolish decisions like jumping off of bridges. In New Mexico, there was kids driving down to Juarez to buy illegal things, you know, so these are things that actually can have huge implications on their life and development. So we've talked a little bit today about how well existing treatments work. And one thing that I'd like to just keep coming back to is that the main intervention that's out there for addiction is talk therapy, right? Everybody's, that's what most of us think of. And for adults, it works okay. So for adults, outcomes at one year post-treatment range from anywhere from about 30% to 80, 98% can achieve abstinence. That means no use, maybe a little bit less, can achieve abstinence one year post-treatment. For kids, the outcomes are much less equivocal. So kids, we are really excited. I'm really excited if I see a third of my kids get better, and that's at like one month, three months post-treatment. We are not finding huge sustained impacts from treatment. And one of the reasons why is because even though we always say things like, use your brain, don't you have a brain, where's your brain, we often forget about the role of the brain in the treatment context. So I think when we're thinking about treatment with kids, we're thinking about a very different beast and we need to think about how the brain functions as a mechanism of treatment response or the lack thereof. So <clears throat> thank, thank goodness we've had a lot of tutorials in fMRI. So those of you who haven't seen it, this, as you know, we've talked before about this magnet. This is an fMRI. Um, and this, I will say that my undergrad degree was in neuroscience. And so as I was thinking about how addiction doesn't work, or I mean, how addiction treatment didn't work that well, I was really curious about what neuroimaging could br bring us. And so I'm not gonna go through this again because we've, we've kind of had a couple tutorials on it, but this is an example of, a, of what um, a stimulus looks like in the context of fMRI. So originally when I thought of looking at treatment elements in the scanner, I thought, oh, it's so easy. Can't we just like do a therapy session in there and measure brain response? And it doesn't work that way. So when you do fMRI treatment, you have to, I mean, fMRI measurement, you have to present these very constrained um, uh, stimuli. And they're, I won't get into the, the meat of it, but it's, it's not, you can't look at you know, exchanges. You have to kind of look at comparisons between two discrete events. And again, what we're looking for is this bold signal. 
So this is, if you look at this peak, that's the movement of blood to different parts of your brain. And that gives us a sense of where you process information. And so this is an example um, from my lab looking at the, at these. T this is juvenile justice involved kids' brain response to these um, decisions of getting an immediate reward now versus a, a, a less reward later. So. Uh, you know, so I thought like, maybe we can use some, this fMRI to kind of understand not only um, how, kind of understand these elements of therapy. So one thing, one of the, the treatments that was talked about before is called motivational enhancement therapy. I do something that's called motivational interviewing, which is actually the kind of the original form of that. And the whole idea is what people talked a lot about change talk versus sustained talk. So change talk is client statements in favor of changing. So that statement's like, you know, it's time for me to cut back. Um, you know, lots of things are getting in the, in the way of my success. It's time for me to make a change. And so there's a lot, been a lot of literature, behavioral literature, showing that that predicts better outcomes. But I was sort of wondering, well, what happens in the brain? Why is this important? Is this just something, an anecdote that we're taught as therapists, or is there something really happening in the brain during that? So what I did was take it to the scanner. So this is a Q exposure paradigm developed by my colleague, Francesca Philby. And it's a gustatory Q exposure, which means it's, these people are getting liquid so in the scanner. Um, and they're getting um, alternating taste of their favorite alcoholic beverage versus lychee juice. And we used lychee juice because it's sweet. Has anybody ever had lychee juice? It's really sweet and delicious, right? And, and so we wanted to see how it was to get an appetitive Q, a sweet Q, a new sweet Q as compared with their favorite drink. And so what Francesca found in this original um, paradigm is that um, alcohol-dependent adults' brains respond differently, that those reward areas respond differently to alcohol as compared with a sweet juice. And so I thought, well, what will happen to their brains if I, put, if I present back parts of their therapy statements, I mean, part, parts of their therapy session before they get this Q exposure? So I did therapy with 10 alcohol-dependent adults. And I played back statements, this, their statements in favor of changing versus their statements in favor of staying the same in the scanner. They heard their own voice, and they saw the statements from their own session. And then we did this Q exposure. <clears throat> and so here's what we found. This is their, when they're thinking about um, staying the same, so this is when they were saying things like, I deserve a drink. You guys don't know how hard my life is. Um, if you were me, you drink too. This is what we saw. And what you'll see is all these areas are reward areas, the areas that Tavi talked about. And these are what we, this is like what you see in a traditional exposure of somebody who's alcohol dependent. But <clears throat> what we found was when we presented them with their statements in favor of changing, so these are things like, Hey, it's time for me to cut back. My kids are really upset about me. Um, that this, what we thought was a static profile of risk, went totally away, and so that was really exciting to us. That said, like, hey, like you know, it had been thought that these that this profile was a permanent risk profile that sort of demarcated alcoholic brains, but not that wasn't the case. When they were thinking about changing, all of that risk exposure went away. So I was really fascinated by that, and I thought. Ooh, if this works in adults, what would this look like with ju juvenile justice involved teens, right? And so I did this with teenagers. So I took, um, here's a, my colleague, Francesca Philby also created a cannabis Q exposure paradigm. And that pipe is from um, police evidence, as it turns out, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I did this with juvenile justice involved kids. These were kids who had been arrested and were on. In, um, in New Mexico, there's something called uh, it's like alternative to incarceration. So the kids are in basically a juvenile justice day camp, which is supposed to actually reintegrate them back into school, but doesn't. They actually sit in a portable all day and don't do anything. And so anyway, and so then, so we took these kids and I wanted to make sure it wasn't therapist effects or just me that we were seeing. So I took eight different therapists and we did the same thing, the whole same paradigm. So we played back their, the statements from their session before we did the Q exposure. And so I'm going to show this as a point of contrast. This is the adult brains. And um, what I'll show you here again is you see all this activation while they're thinking about staying the same. And with the kids, we see exactly the opposite pattern. No activation when they were thinking about staying the same. So this, when they were saying, like, oh, I deserve to use cannabis, we saw nothing, nothing exciting. 
But when they were thinking about changing, we see lots of activation. And for those of you who are not familiar with the brain, those areas like the precuneus, um, anterior cingulate cortex, are areas that are involved in introspection and contemplation. So we saw the opposite pattern of adults and in totally different areas, not reward, but in contemplation and introspection areas. Further, you know, the people that I work with say, yeah, those pictures are nice, but how do they actually lead to behavior change? So I thought, okay, let's see. So we looked at the correlation between that activation and one month cannabis problems. And the more activation we saw, the less cannabis problems. And the same, the more activation we saw during change talk, the less cannabis dependence at one month post-treatment. So, so what does that mean? You know, so that has brought us to think a little bit more, not only about how client behaviors might be a mechanism of change, it's something that causes change, but now also, as a therapist, I've thought, well, what does this mean in terms of how we can change interventions for providers, right? What can we t tell them about what to do so that they can do more effective treatments with kids? And this is a source of a new grant of mine from NIAAA. So, and you know, <laughs> Tavi mentioned, we, this is kind of the pilot data for that. So what we found here is, in fact, when therapists did something called complex reflections, these are very effortful statements um, that you do in session that are things like uh, interpreting and kind of presenting back hypotheses to clients as, compo as compared to closed questions. This is what you get in the hospital, like, have you ever tried AA? Does your mom know that you're drinking? That sort of thing. That we saw more activation when the therapist did the more advanced type of um, therapeutic techniques. And further, these um, therapist statements were also related to one month importance of changing. So the more activation during these statements, the better outcomes that these kids had in terms of their assessment of how important it was to change one month post-treatment. And I won't get into the nitty gritty, but basically what we're really trying to do is break out, as um, Dr. Posner talked about, trying to break out the mechanisms of what might be happening in the brain during treatment between therapists, clients, and their behavior change. And really looking at these specific brain areas in that role. So um, kind of to the big questions, you know, I think there's been some movement and some questioning about what role the brain can play in thinking about how to make treatments better. And this is a really great paper by Nasser Nakhvi, um, kind of showing how brain can be one neural, can be one way we measure whether or not people respond to treatment. We also had a paper recently that we put out where we talked about, you know, using the brain as a way of figuring out what might be an area of response, what might be the areas of mechanisms. But I think the, the two places I'll also point out here too is that we think it's really, really important to also update our models based on the data that we find and then also disseminate our findings to other clinicians in the field. So I do a lot of work with other training practitioners and so we really try to use our brain data to, uh, to improve our models. And the concrete example I'll give you of that is when we found out that change talk had an empirical basis in the brain, that meant that we spent a lot more time clinically, or when I advise clinicians, I tell them to spend a lot more time working on this mechanism of treatment response in the therapeutic room. Does that make sense? So not just, so we really are trying to take the brain data and use it, implement it in the day-to-day -day practice with clinicians. So. Um, so I was told by Tavi that I could have some plugs, so I'm going to pl make some plugs. So what I would say is, you know, um, uh, Earl Blumenauer talked about this before, but I think having cannabis as a schedule and one drug here in um, Oregon is a huge big deal. It prevents our ability to look at what's happening in the adolescent brain with this drug around. We also need money now to, in order to evaluate what, how recreational cannabis use is affecting kids. So, you know, as an adolescent treatment provider, I'm asked over and over again about how this change in recreational law has, is impacting our kids, our kids' brains. And with the ABCD study, we'll know in 10 years. But part of us needs to know about how these changes in policy and legislation are affecting kids as it's happening. And we really, this was legalized last year, 
and that money still hasn't been available. And unfortunately, we are really, I really worry that we're missing this window to be able to examine how these things are happening as they're happening right now. And this is something that other states are, are looking to us for. So I think we just really need to think about that. We have this amazing opportunity, and if we had the resources to empirically evaluate it, we would be at a great advantage. So uh, we have a, a book that just came out kind of integrating neuroimaging with psychosocial treatment for those of you who are interested. And I want to thank my lab and my funders and my family. <laughs> All right, thanks.